It was the height of the baby boom and the Galvin family kept growing. 12 children, 10 boys, two girls. What they didn't expect was what came next and that half would be diagnosed with schizophrenia. Robert Kolker is an investigative journalist and his new book looks deeply into their story. It's called Hidden Valley Road Inside the Mind of an American Family. And Robert Kolker joins us now from Brooklyn, New York. Hi, Robert, how are you? Hello, I'm fine. It's great to talk to you. It's really nice to meet you. Congratulations on this book. It's excellent. Um, and it was actually chosen for uh, the Oprah Book Club pick. I loved what you posted on Twitter that you had to be picked up off the floor when you heard this news. Is that correct? That's for sure. I, um, it was not on my radar. Uh, the club often, you know, most often chooses fiction. So it's not like I went to bed every night thinking, well, maybe Oprah will pick this book. So when it happened, I was just shocked. But then in hindsight, I realized that mental health and, and mental health issues are really important to her. And so I understood why. And I, in a different era, when Oprah had her daily TV show, I think this family probably would have been on it. So I, I see what, what the connection was there for her. And especially during this time, because your book was coming out right when uh, the pandemic happened and you had to do a pivot. You were supposed to be going on a book tour. And so maybe this is like a silver lining to be chosen to be part of this book club. I'm definitely in a very privileged position. There are a lot of authors who were struggling to break through in this moment. And, uh, and of course, you know, it's a moment that's happening to all of us, not just writers or authors or publishers. Mm -hmm. But one inspiring thing has been to see the experimentation going on in the publishing industry, people doing virtual events, uh, um, college classes and book clubs and booksellers and publishers all coming together and community organizations to get authors out there. So that's been great to see. Well, this book is, um, it's really, it's really hard to put down. Um, your writing is exquisite. It's just a wonderful book. And I am going to make the attempt to read a passage from your book so we can start our conversation. And you're actually going to be on the show twice because there's so much to get through with the book that we decided to do two shows. Um, so you write, the dozen children in the Galvin family perfectly spanned the baby boom. Donald was born in 1945, Mary in 1965. Their century was the American century. Their parents, Mimi and Don, were born just after the Great War, met during the Great Depression, married during World War II, and raised their children during the Cold War. As their family grew, they witnessed entire cultural movements come and go, and then all the Galvins made their own contribution to the culture as a monumental case study in humanity's most perplexing disease. The Galvins on the outside appeared to be the quintessential all-American family, were they? Well, they certainly were at first, and, and they were sort of an extreme version of that because there were 12 children uh, born over 20 years, spanning the baby boom. Um, and they weren't just 12 children, they were 12 exemplary children, at least outwardly. At young ages, they were star athletes and they were musicians. Uh, the mother took them out to identify mushrooms out in the woods. Um, and she you know, taught them about symphonies and operas. And uh, they were well known in the community for flying falcons. The falconry was the family pastime. Their father, Don, was the one who first suggested that the United States Air Force make the falcon its mascot. He taught at the Air Force Academy and everybody knew about him as the falcon man and as them as the, the falconry family. So for a time there, they were this kind of larger than life, almost a Von Trapp family. Uh, situation there. Why 12 children? Because this is a question that a lot of people um, that you spoke to asked. Well, the first people to get sick, it happened in their early 20s. And so all 12 children were born before there was any real definitive sign of mental illness. So that I think an early question I had was, why did they keep having children if there was so much schizophrenia? But it really, the schizophrenia came later. Um, but I think the bigger answer is that they not only enjoyed having lives of distinction for having such a large family, I think it also filled a, a hole in their life. They, they were uprooted and forced to move out west from New York. Mimi grew up without a father. The father her father left the family in scandal. And uh, Mimi was happy with having so many children because her own husband 
uh, was becoming more and more absent as well. So there were a lot of different a lot of different itches that uh, having a lot of children scratched for this family. And how did you find this story? I was good friends with a friend of the family, and he introduced me to them. He introduced me to the two youngest Galvins, the sisters, who were in their 50s by the time I met them. And for decades, they'd been looking for a way to talk about their family and to let the world know about them, because they knew that scientists had been studying them for years, but they really didn't know everything that the scientists had found out and their participation had been anonymous. They also were trying to reconstruct some of their own family history. And as the youngest, they needed an impartial journalist to go out there and interview everyone. I was amazed when I first heard about this story. There's sexual abuse, and there's clergy abuse, and there's a murder-suicide, and of course there's schizophrenia, and there's scientific research. It all seemed just amazing that all this could happen to one family, and even more amazing that they remained a family. And I. I thought that it would be best told as a family saga, but the only way to really do that would be to talk to absolutely every living family member. So before I even started on the book in earnest, I spent a year getting to know uh, every single living family member in the Galvins to make sure that they were all right being interviewed. And that, I think, is something novel that this book has to offer. It's a, it's a family story where everybody's point of view is stitched together so that it feels like something more authoritative than one person's point of view. And you also needed to have everybody on side for privacy reasons, right? Um, what struck me as really interesting was that the mom, Mimi, spent most of her life uh, kind of like uh, living a double life. Um, be behind the walls in their home, it was very different from what the community saw them to be for a time anyway. Why would the family members agree to this book when most of their, their lives, it, it, was hit, uh, it was secret, it was putting up appearances. A lot of time had passed since the more difficult moments for the family. The first son started getting sick in the late 60s and early 70s, and then the first scientists visited the family in the mid 80s, and they came to me in 2016. So they felt like time was running out, and if, that if anyone was going to tell their story, now would be the time. Also. This isn't just a story of unspeakable tragedy and of a medical mystery. It's a story of, a, of survival and, and, and of resilience. It's about two sisters and then many of the well brothers as well who have found a way to come to terms with their family and a family that remained a family when so many others in this situation would have been cast to the winds. And so they, they felt like they had something inspiring to share uh, with the public. I think that the thing I always say is that in that first conversation I had with the two sisters, I was the one who was depressed. They were very happy. You know, I was just shocked and, and so saddened to hear about all these things that had happened to this one family. And they were excited and pleased to finally be unburdening themselves and sharing it and having the possibility of letting the world know about them. Um, I'm glad that you brought that up because when you read this book, um, there are a lot of victims, and I had to remind myself not to make other people into uh, villains. How did you approach writing this book without picking sides? Well, I'm not exactly an advocacy journalist. I'm, I'm not going in to, um, to argue one side or another or to take up a cause, but I am certainly uh, not prosecutorial either. Like, when I go into an interview, I'm not trying to get somebody to admit something or trying to trip them up or catch them. I'm trying to understand their rationale and then trying to stitch together the facts and to tell something fair and accurate, but above all, sensitive and intimate. So I'm not looking for heroes or villains. I'm, I'm looking for people, complicated people, who are dealing with a complicated situation and, and doing so in a very dramatic and vivid way, in a way that readers might actually identify with. You know, you have so many different siblings dealing with the same family tragedy in so many different ways. To me, one of the exciting potentials of this book is that readers can sort of look at it and wonder, well, which one am I most like? How would I have dealt with this situation? Am I sometimes more like this sibling or like that sibling? Do I hate the mother or do I love the mother? Or is it something in between? I, I think there are no e easy answers there, and I think that's true of most people's families as well. Um, I want to read another passage from your book where you attempted to describe what schizophrenia 
feels like. And you write, the most dreadful thing perhaps about schizophrenia and what most sets it apart from other brain conditions like autism or Alzheimer's, which tend to dilute and dissipate a person's most identifiable personality traits, is how boldly emotional it can be. The symptoms muffle nothing and amplify everything. They're deafening, overpowering for the subject, and frightening for those who love them. Impossible for anyone close to them to process intellectually. For a family, schizophrenia is primarily a felt experience, as if the foundation of the family is permanently tilted in the direction of the sick family member. Even if just one child has schizophrenia, everything about the internal logic of that family changes. How did the internal logic of the Galvin family change when six of their children eventually had schizophrenia? I think for the other six siblings, it, it was about either wondering whether you were going to go insane next or um, uh, wondering who else would be next and, and not being sure exactly of whether you could actually control the situation at all. Um, and then trying very hard to send a message to your parents that you weren't a problem, that you weren't going to become mentally ill. So that meant a certain amount of perfectionism for some of the kids uh, who weren't mentally ill. And then some of them tried to leave as soon as they can, could just, and then you know came back when they could. It, it, you had a, um, a certain hypervigilance that they all share even to this day, all of the well siblings do. They're all very different people, but they all are sort of on their guard because how couldn't you be growing up in that house? Um, particularly when early on, uh, the parents were determined to keep it quiet and not be open about it to anyone else. They had to keep a secret, a terrible secret. It just feels like layers and layers of trauma um, uh, with what happened in the home and then to kind of live this life where you do have all these walls around. Yes, uh, you're making me think of the youngest Galvin sibling. Um, her name is Mary. And as a girl in middle school, she would be at home uh, having to stay out of the way of two or three, sometimes even four mentally ill brothers living at home at the same time, fighting with one another. And then you know, she would do her best to try to be out of the house as much as possible, go to ballet practice or soccer practice, anywhere but home. And every time she was outside the house, she projected this incredible confidence, this huge smile, um, as if nothing was wrong. And that's something that she came by honestly, she watched her mother try to do the same thing and she wanted to do that too. And it's something she still can do today when she wants to. It's really, it's really quite something to see. Even when something is going on that's very difficult, she just beams a smile. And when I talked to her childhood friends, they all said they never knew anything was wrong. They always thought that she had it all together. And it's that kind of dichotomy that I wanted to explore in the book. Of the 12 children, uh, six boys have it. Does this illness affect males more than females? Um, males have a slight edge, but it's not significant. Um, and it hasn't been really nailed down that, it, that it's a sex dependent thing. With this particular family, the genetic information that they finally have found out and the revelations that come up at the end of this book point to a mutation that women seem to be carriers for, but they don't manifest it. So it comes from the mother's side of the family, but the mother never had it. Um, and to me, that that's interesting. They, they um, The researchers aren't sure why it's sex dependent, but everybody's schizophrenia is different. That's that's what I'm learning about families like the Galvins and, and really anyone with schizophrenia. The genetic mutations are different, but how they affect brain function is something they all share. And that's how families can help be an amazing research tool to get to the bottom of this mysterious disease. And within, with the six boys that had it, it presented itself differently with each one of them. How did it manifest itself with the, the six that had it? It was really important for me not to make this book into a monster movie, not to say, and then uh, one of them went insane, and then another, and then another. Instead, I wanted to make sure that these people were people too, and that that turned out to be far, far more straightforward and easy than I thought it would be, because they are different people, and they all manifest their illnesses differently. Donald, uh, the oldest son and the first to manifest mental illness, he started 
engaging in random impulsive behavior that even he couldn't understand, sometimes very destructive behavior, like running into a bonfire during a pep rally and having some burns or um, torturing a cat. And eventually his behavior escalated until even he didn't understand why he was doing these things. And he was frightened and, and off balance. And then once he had a psychotic break, he became hyper-religious and, uh, and never really stopped and, and delusional as well. And only in recent years is he much more mellow and, and contemplative as a person, but still believes that he's the offspring of an octopus and, and talks a lot about uh, religious things. And then with Peter, um, it was very different, yeah. right? Oh, sorry. That's right. Yeah, uh, there's Peter. Peter uh, had his psychotic break at a much earlier age. He was sort of oppositional and, and defiant. But then once he had his break, he was um, really uh, almost a mix between schizophrenic and bipolar, um, where he would really have these these vision delusions of grandeur and also would self-medicate with drugs. But um, and then... Uh, he ended up, you know, really benefiting from electroconvulsive therapy, which is otherwise known as shock therapy, which was able to sort of help uh, normalize him a little bit. But he had this sort of pipe, you know, revolving door that a lot of mentally ill people have between jail and the hospital and home, where he really was never able to find a, a groove in his life until finally he needed full-time care. Then there was Jim, who was paranoid and engaged in a lot of self-harm and eventually was abusive to his wife and sexually abusive to his two little sisters, the youngest members of the Galvin family. That's a, probably the one of the more horrible aspects of this book, that, that he wa was uh, you know, that abusive to the people around him. And then Brian um, had a, no apparent signs, according to his family. He was the rock star of the family. He moved off to California and played in a rock and roll band and all seemed to be going well. And then one day they heard that he went to his ex-girlfriend's house and shot her and then shot himself. And it was learned later that he had been prescribed an antipsychotic medication uh, for a time there. And so it seems that schizophrenia also is something he was dealing with. Um, and then there's Joseph, who was actually quite mellow and very, very tranquil and very, very gentle and was one of the only brothers who really understood that he had a sickness. So he would look up in the sky and say that a Chinese emperor was talking to him from the clouds, and he would turn to his sister or whoever was with him and say, I'm having a hallucination. Don't, don't you see it too? Um, and so that was very poignant for that to happen. And then finally, Matthew is very grumpy and, and grouchy and, and believes that the state owes him uh, money for building all of the roads in the state of Colorado and 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 feels like he controls the weather and for a time thought that he was Paul McCartney, but with the right medicine was able to live independently for decades and even drive and volunteer at a homeless shelter and, um, and really have a, in his way, a very productive life. So, so they, they all are, are very different people. Um, the two youngest were the girls, Margaret and Mary, who later became Lindsay. They didn't have schizophrenia, but they suffered as a result of what was happening in the house. Can you tell us a little bit about them? One reason why the, everyone in the family was interested in talking with me was because the sisters were ready to talk about what had happened to them. And so they wanted to defer to the sisters because the sisters had so much important you know, wisdom to share about how to get through trauma like this. You know, they both lived in the house uh, when it was at its most chaotic, they both left to go to their brother Jim's house on weekends to escape the family, and then Jim would sexually abuse them there. So it was really a horrible out of the frying pan and into the fire kind of situation. And it was it was um, desperately sad for a time there. But then in the book, I go very, very uh, specifically into how each of them were able to come to terms with uh, their childhood traumas and move through them and find some peace and re-engage with their family on their own terms. And they both do it in very, very different ways. Um, uh, along the way, there, there's an almost, you know, Dickensian turn of events where one of the sisters, Margaret, gets plucked out of the family and, and by a rich benefactor and, and allowed to live with them while she finishes high school. And meanwhile, Mary 
is left behind until she's able to get away to boarding school herself. And she changes her name to Lindsay to escape the family. But eventually she finds her way back and becomes the caregiver for her brothers. Meanwhile, you know, Margaret has one marriage that goes bad. They both have, you know, substance issues for a while. They, they both are, are running away from their past as much as they possibly can. And it's how they find their way back through various forms of therapy and reflection and, and helping of others. That really is, I think, the most inspiring aspect of this book. Um, and later on, they both have very different relationships with their mother, Mimi. Now, along the way, uh, stigma seemed to play a pivotal role in preventing the family from seeking help and also in keeping their, secret, their secrets hidden. Having researched this extensively, does stigma still exist with this illness? It's better now, but it still exists. Um, one bellwether of this is that both I and my editor, Chris Popolo, found that in the years that I was working on this book, we would tell people about the book, each of us individually, and then we would hear from now and then from people who we thought we knew well about how there was somebody with this sort of acute mental illness in their family that they just never had talked about before. It just mm -hmm. is not discussed. But, you know, things do change. We've seen in, in, in my lifetime, I've seen um, bipolar illness and, and autism and anxiety and depression all become less stigmatized. And it's possible that this could happen with schizophrenia as well. It might be almost the last domino to fall. And I think that's because like the excerpt of the book showed earlier and that you read aloud, it's a very loud and emotional disease. And, and it kind of destroys the personality of a person who has it and replaces them with a stranger who cannot be ignored. It's almost like you experience the death of that loved one. And it's a, it's a shock that you really don't want to grapple with. That's why families like the Galvins kept it swept under the rug. It's only a little bit better now, but certainly it's better to the point that if, if you have the means and you have good access to health care, your family can get support now in a way that the Galvins never would have been able to get support. Instead, they were, they were around at a time where the families were blamed, where particularly mothers were blamed for schizophrenia, for causing schizophrenia in their children. And that was just... Uh, a horrible trauma for Mimi, the mother, to endure. We're going to talk about more, that more tomorrow. Um, just to pick up on what you were saying, one of the things you write about is how hard it is for people, even family members, to see the person for who they are and not just see the disease. Uh, were you able to get a sense of that from any of the brothers? Yes. I, I talked to Mark Galvin, who is not mentally ill, but Mark was closest in age to, to three brothers. Um, Peter, Joe, and Matt, and and the four of them were like four peas in a pod. They played hockey together, often on the same teams, and they were all in the newspaper together when as star athletes. Um, it almost like it was like they were their own little family inside the family. And then one by one, all three of those brothers, you know, Peter, and then Matt, and then Joseph, all had psychotic breaks and became mentally ill. And for Mark those were his strongest relationships in the family by far. And it was almost like he was orphaned. He certainly was marooned. And, and it's not like these brothers had died. It's that they had been taken away from him and replaced with people who were complete strangers. And, and this is a trauma that I, I'm not so sure he's completely gotten over. And so you, you see exactly how he, he feels a loss whenever he's around those brothers. And yet, also knows that he owes it to them to maintain relationships with them. Did you get a sense from the healthy siblings whether or not they felt guilty for not having the illness? Oh, absolutely. There, there's lots of guilt. There's And there's guilt for fearing the worst as well. That, that I talked to di several different siblings who would go through periods of saying, you know, what happens if one of my brothers tries to shoot the president or 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 you know, becomes violent or, 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 or tries to hurt me. And then, um, you know, they read something in the paper about John Hinckley Jr., for instance, and they wonder this. And then, you know, a, a little time passes and they start to feel guilty for feeling this way. They think, you know, there but for the grace of God go I. I could have been the one who was mentally ill, not them. And then some siblings, like Lindsay, um, wonder why. They, they think, why was it that I was spared? And she became convinced that the very aggressive therapy that she had to get over the trauma of her sexual abuse also helped her 
uh, with any vulnerability she had to mental illness. And she wondered if uh, some of her brothers had earlier interventions, if they had had mental health care at the age of 15, say, instead of 25, if maybe they'd be spared some of the worst of what happened to them. And that's, I think, the great hope of the book, that if a family like the Galvins happened today, there is a better chance that they'd be treated at 15 and not 25. We have about a minute left. Um, you had the opportunity to speak to Mimi, the mother, before she passed away. What was it like uh, speaking to her? I got to see every aspect of her, even though she was 90 or 91. She was sharp and, and very much with it, just physically frail. And I saw just how energetic she was and determined she was to advocate for her sick children. But I also saw her tunnel vision and her capacity for deflecting unpleasant uh, subjects. And so I, I understood exactly everything that uh, her children said about her that was admirable and also what they felt were her shortcomings. And, and she also, at the end of the day, was inspiring. She used to say, you can't be heartbroken every day, which I thought was an amazing thing for someone in her position to say. Robert, thank you so much. Um, we'll see you again tomorrow. Lots more to talk about in the book. We appreciate your time. Thanks so much. The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.